Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel. Welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. This episode is a discussion with the remarkable Dutch scholar of the Quran, of Arabic linguistics, of comparative historical linguistics, Marijn van Putten. Uh, you're going to really want to um, pay attention closely to this one, to spread the news to everyone. Um, with Marijn, we discuss his most recent book on Quranic Arabic, and um, there are all sorts of really intriguing insights that challenge the status quo, both of traditional views and of Western academic views. Uh, he will explain and give precise examples um, of why the Quran is uh, written and was proclaimed in uh, what we might call Hejazi Arabic, so the dialect of Western Arabia, not in a so-called poetic koine, but he also has some interesting things to say about the nature of Hijazi Arabic and of the reading traditions, which are held to um, be uh, the canonical or standard ways of pronouncing the Quranic text. So um, yeah, it's a really interesting discussion. Please help me out, friends, and spread the news of this channel. Please subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Please like this video and spread the news to everyone uh, around you um, far and wide. Thank you so much. Ryan Van Putten, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Good to see you. Good to see you again. So I'm really excited to have a conversation with you. And I think a lot of the viewers on this channel, Exploring the Quran and the Bible, uh, have been waiting for this, expecting, like you've seen other people have come on and they're like, wait, wait, where's Marijn? So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're really great to speak about, especially your recent book, but larger questions in regard to the Arabic of the Quran, but also questions of reading traditions um, surrounding um, the transmission of the Quran. So I'll start with sort of a formal uh, bio, and then um, we'll get right to it, if that sounds okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. So friends, everyone, Ryan Van Putin is a researcher that uh, specializes in the linguistic and textual history of the Quran. His main focus currently is on the history of the Quranic reading traditions, both as it appears in the literary sources and in the manuscript record. Besides this, he has published on questions regarding Quranic paleography, and textual criticism and extensively on the linguistic history of both Quranic Arabic and the modern dialects. He also continues to publish on the linguistic history of the Berber and Semitic language families. And really important to add here at the end, his um, what I think is a groundbreaking um, a book, a sort of um, a watershed moment, I think, for the study of Quranic Arabic, also manuscript studies is uh, his, his recent uh, book recently published, Quranic Arabic from its Hejazi origins to its classical reading tradition. So just published 2022 uh, and it's published with Brill in the studies in Semitic languages and linguistic series. Uh, and a really big news is that it is publicly available open access. So um, maybe I'll just start by asking you like, if people wanna get to the book, how, how do they do it? Yeah, uh, well, just just search Quranic Arabic and Marae van Putten, and and you'll find it. Uh, so it, it's just on a real website, uh, and yeah, you can just download it. Uh, it'll still cost you an arm and a leg to actually get the physical copy, but um, the, the, the the PDF is free. So I'm very very excited about that. It's really really wonderful that I was able to uh, get some funding actually from the funding agency that that funded my my research, the NWO, um, which is not the New World Order, but the Nederlandse Instituut voor Wetenschappelijk Onderzoek. Um, but uh, they, they they said you know any any research that has been done with us uh, you can ask for some funding to make it to make it open access. I was like, well, that's a great idea. And luckily, Brill knew of this uh, this possibility, so they were like, please don't do use it. So I, I use it. So yeah. now it's open access, which is just really great. exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's a great it's a great resource. And I mean, uh, open access is the way of the future. Um, I mean, yeah, there sure. there are sort of issues of of justice uh, in, involved in. Um, you know, in, information should be publicly available. That's my, <laughs> that's my opinion. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, um, why don't we just start with a general question um, that sort of uh, lets us enter also into a little bit of your own journey in academics and outside of academics. So how did you enter the field of linguistics? I know you've worked on Berber in addition to, to Arabic, so linguistics generally, but then Arabic Quranic linguistics in particular. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really long story of stuff that just kind of got out of hand uh, as these things go. So, um, like, if I go really far back, you know, the first time that I really got interested in doing languages at all was when I started studying some Japanese back in high school, and I thought it was really interesting. 
but you know, instead of being interested in Jap just Japanese, I was like, well, I mean, Japanese is cool, so I'll check out some Chinese, I'll check out some Korean. So I started studying some Japanese and Korean, and then some Mongolian, and it got all out of hand. Um, and um, then I was like, well, you know, I want to do something with you know studying languages and, and what's fun about that. So I, I found Lady University, which is of course still even today, uh, although they're closing lots of the language teaching possibilities, um, still, you know, one of the greatest universities in the world to learn languages and especially linguistics. So I started studying comparative Indo-European uh, linguistics, which is historical linguistics of specifically the Indo-European languages. So that's the language family of most languages of Europe and um, Iran and, and, and India, well, Northern India, I should say. Right, right. Um, which all go back to a single ancestor, right? And that kind of stuff, I really got into like historical linguistics. I thought it was incredibly interesting to kind of, you know, peel back the layers of language and find, find out like, what did this prehistoric common, common uh, language, you know, look like of these people and of other people? And, you know, I started doing other things. And then during my master's, I got really, really into Berber linguistics. So the Berber languages are indigenous languages of North Africa, uh, completely unrelated to, to, well, not completely unrelated, but very, very distantly related to Arabic and Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. um, and, but lots of influence from Arabic. And I, I thought it was just such a cool and interesting language. And I started uh, studying it and working with it with my, uh, my mentor and who ended up you know, becoming my, my supervisor for my PhD research, um, Martin Kosman, um, who really supported me. So I ended up writing a PhD thesis on, on Adjula Berber, uh, which is a Berber dialect spoken in uh, Libya. It's um, uh, the, Eastern, I always get West and East mixed up, easternmost uh, Berber dialect, except for uh, the dialect spoken in Siwa uh, in Egypt, which is just slightly over the border. And um, okay. I say slightly, but you could probably fit the Netherlands in between the two towns, but you know, there's nothing in between. Yes. Um, but so so I wrote a thesis on that, and this was around the time that, um, that you know, uh, the, the, well, let's call it a revolution in Libya was going on. So I couldn't do any field work there, which was a blessing for me because that meant I had a very good excuse to work with the written sources that were around. So I wrote a grammar of this of this dialect uh, of which it wasn't so sure whether it was still spoken or not. Uh, by now, we have some evidence that yes, it's still spoken, but it's still okay. difficult to find like data about this. Okay. Um, and I had done some Arabic uh, and, you know, working with Berber, Berber, you know, some of the Berber languages have, you know, 50% of the vocabulary is Arabic, yeah. uh, you know, very right. similar to speak right. English from French or Latin. Right, or maybe um, Persian from Arabic. Or... Right, right, exactly. And so, uh, so you know, I kind of got into that. I did a, I, I did some Arabic in the past, but it wasn't really ever my, my focus. It was just always something that kind of interested me and I worked with Semitic languages and with that, I, I worked on that. Um, but then, you know, my, my now very good friend, Ahmed Al-Jalad came to Leida and he, um, you know, he was doing this really amazing stuff with, with early Islamic Arabic, pre-Islamic Arabic especially. And he um, he was really opening up something within within um, Arabic, I think, which always bothered me. I always looked at Arabic, and especially when I was learning classical Arabic, I was like, who in their right mind would write classical Arabic like this? Um, we might be able to get into that in a little bit. It's like, yeah. it's such a bizarre spelling for, for, for the language that it writes. Um, I was like, there's something weird going on here. And I, I remember doing my, my, um, my uh, Semitics classes and trying to like solve Arabic. And it's like, I couldn't, of course, because I didn't have enough background. Um, but, you know, I started working on that, started working with him. Uh, I started working, especially on some, some modern Arabic dialectology and then the historical aspect of that. And that's kind of how I rolled into Arabic. I felt like there's actually a lot to do here, lots of cool stuff to do here. Um, I got some funding uh, for year for some, I mean, a lot of funding for year research project to work on early Islamic Arabic, which I really felt like something to do. And I originally promised that I would do all of early Islamic Arabic, um, especially focusing on the Arabic as it appears in Greek transcriptions, Coptic transcriptions, uh, Sasanian uh, transcriptions, kind of figure out what we can do. Because there you can get the, you can get the vowels uh, from those. Vowels. That, that, that's that's a big thing. Yeah, and sometimes also certain phonetics which you could not get from the letters otherwise. Uh, so and Judeo Arabic, and I worked on all of that a little bit. Uh, but I noticed very soon that there was actually one huge linguistic source 
of early Islamic Arabic that bizarrely enough wasn't being used, which was the Quran. I was like, that's that's a very strange source not to be using because it's it's you know it's it's the biggest corpse we have in that period, and it's the most important book of the period. Um, but people weren't weren't using it in in any linguistic way. Um, so I just kind of accidentally rolled into Arabic, and from there, you know, I was working on the Quran. I was like, well, I need to be know where that text comes from. Um, so then I started working on the manuscript stuff, and that really got me where I am today. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, I'm wondering, as you, you were speaking, I was wondering um, how important you find it to have a larger sort of linguistic uh, formation in working through particular questions of Arabic linguistics. Does that make sense? I mean, do yeah, you find no, like yeah, the, yeah. the work you've done on East Asian languages and Berber, which are different language yeah. families, do, I mean, is that sort oh, of training? Yeah. yeah, it's very important. It's very important. So, so really, um, Historical linguistics is, is, is a real subdiscipline of linguistics, and uh, it's the one that I'm trained in. And it's you have to be trained in that kind of discipline to, to know what kinds of questions to ask. And mm -hmm. many people who work even work on the language of, of, of you know even linguistic side of Arabic are very much trained within a kind of um, Arabic framework. And, you know, it's not just me, Ahmed al Jalad is just as much as me, you know, comes from the historical linguistic um, uh, side, um, rather than, than say, the Arabistic side. Um, my thing just made sound, I'll uh, make sure that I, I don't get distracted anymore. There we go. No worries. Um, no um, so uh, let me retake that a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's it's very important to to you know um, have that have that background and also just having these comparisons, trying to figure out what's going on and knowing what to expect from a language and what a language is expected to do in the history of it, of its development. Um, you need to have done tons of languages, and I've, I've you know you've I've done tons very broadly and uh, all kinds of things, um, and it's it's great fun, but it's also that's that's important. So I have that background in linguistics. I think it's. Uh, Big deal. Yeah, it, it certainly comes through in um, in your work, uh, and also it makes your Twitter feed. By the way, everyone should be following Mariah. Okay. Uh, Thank an you. Incredible, an incredible follow. Uh, so, uh, yes. Well, before we get into, I mean, we'll have a chance to speak about how you apply that linguistics background to the particular questions of the Quran. I mean, one of the the, the remarkable things about the book is you. Uh, you make the point that there's just been sort of received um, assumptions, truisms about mm -hmm. the Quran and Quranic Arabic that upon examination are actually um, questionable or maybe completely lack of foundation. So that there's a sort of revolutionary aspect to, to this work. But before we get into all of that, uh, I usually like to ask people uh, something about the world, their, um, uh, their uh, life and interests outside of the world of academics. So yeah, what do you do when you're not studying linguistics, uh, hobbies, uh, books, movies, uh, other things? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I really wish I read more fiction than I actually do, but, but uh, I, I love doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm a real, real uh, especially like fantasy and science fiction nerd. Uh, I like that stuff a lot. Okay. Uh, but what I really spend most of my time on um, in terms of hobbies, I do a lot of tabletop role-playing games. Okay. So, you know, things like Dungeon Dragons. I don't specifically play Dungeon Dragons. I play Blades in the Dark, which is a great, great tabletop game. And, you know, you sit and you kind of throw dice and, and fantasize what, what is going to happen with this, you know, gang of scoundrels in a, in a world that is haunted <laughs> by spirits. And it's great. Uh, I, I really, it's, it's incredibly nerdy, but it's really a lot of fun to do. Wonderful. Uh, besides that, you know, I, I really like playing, playing computer games as well. Uh, so I do quite a bit of that. I develop my own game. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's what I work on. Yeah. Terrific. And um, circling back to academics, uh, we'll have a chance to speak about a few of the main players in the history of scholarship on chronic Arabic. But could we start just by um, uh, mentioning a few uh, books or a few scholars who have been important for your formation within this field, within Arabic linguistics, Quranic studies? Yeah. Um... Sure. So, so I mean, obviously, just incredibly important and, and all very recent. And what really got me into it is, is, is Ahmed Al Jalad's work. Um, his work is just amazing, really interesting, really exciting, um, and really inspiring because it's it's really a kind of paradigm in which he 
approaches a linguistic was very much in line with how I do it, uh, but very much not what you saw within linguistics of Arabic in general. Um, but still, I mean, so I think I think Joshua Blau, uh, who's worked a lot on Christian Arabic and, and Judeo Arabic, right? right. Um, I mean, it's just and recently passed away only um, uh, is is really just I mean a giant uh, and and sometimes incredibly wrong, but at the same time just just so smart and and see so many things and of course much broader as well right he, he has done a lot of hebrew stuff and is very important for that as well can, can um, I just on that point i mean it's sort of a tangent but it's interesting to me i mean the point of christian arabic is not just that it's arabic written by christians but that it, it represents what's sometimes called i think middle arabic right this um yeah. some sort of space between the dialects and the formal language is that is that right yeah um yes and no um okay. <laughs> so no so, so so yes uh and and i i disagree with a lot of that um okay. so i think um so so this is the one of the things like i think his work on especially early christian arabic that stuff looks very close to the quran to me mm. it's just because he knew what the quran was supposed to look like which didn't look like what his stuff looked like rather than actually look at the quran uh, he never quite made that connection but i think it's very close and i kind of in, in the appendix of my book i i make some connections, but at some point I decided this is much bigger than I want it to be. And then I should actually be looking at all these Christian gospels rather than just work from his book. Uh, so I'm not doing that, but my my good friend, uh, Philip Stokes is is doing a lot of great work on, on Christian Arabic. And it's a lot more complex. Like it's certainly not classical Arabic, but it's certainly not vernacular either. And they're doing all kinds of funky stuff, um, which is very reminiscent of the Quranic reading traditions. Uh, but then within Christian stuff, um, but yes, there is something going on. There's maybe some interaction with the vernacular going on, and but there's certainly, certainly different linguistic norms going on, and that's true for um, Judeo Arabic as well. And the question is, do they all use the same norm? Well, with the Christian Arabic, it's very clear. No, that's not the case. Like different places seem to use different linguistic norms. Um, for Judeo Arabic, probably not either, but it's less clear. Um, there seems to be maybe more more interaction or something like that. That's my impression at least, but it's hard to say. Um, so, but we generally call that Middle Arabic, and it's a terrible term. We should not use it and okay. figure something out. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so, uh, Blau is really really inspiring. Who else? Um, so, I think. Um, um, now, what's his first name? Oh, Corriente uh, Fernando. Is that right? It's definitely, it's definitely an F. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so really also a person he's worked a lot on Andalusian Arabic, uh, but also very much from a linguistic perspective. And he, I think, has some very interesting um, insights into, into how to think about um, the history of the language. I think he, you know, also very often like don't agree with him at all, but I think he's, he's, he's quite inspiring in that sense. And another one is uh, Dan Adim. Um, who's still alive and 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 kicking and and doing fantastic work? And he wrote mm -hmm. in the eighties a series of articles on the orthography of um, the Quran mm -hmm. and uh, what it could tell us about the linguistics. And I think he's very conservative when it comes to that stuff. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, it's it's brilliant and lots of amazing amazing insights. Mm -hmm. And that's really 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 great as well. So those are just D, D, D I E M right? D I E M. Yeah, yeah. yeah, interesting, interesting, great. Well, let's let's start speaking about um, the book. And at least um, you know, as I was uh, reading through um, the, your remarkable summaries of the book on Twitter. So if people want a, a good introduction before they get to the book itself, it's a re really a uh, useful way of um, engaging with some of your ideas. And you sort of start with the big question of what is the language of the Quran or what are assumptions about the language of the Quran? And you note a number of scholars, I think writing in the 1940s, uh, who mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, came, um, I, I think Blacher may be among them, maybe he was in the 50s. Yeah. When he wrote. Yeah. But anyway, who basically affirm um, that the Quran is written in what is the so-called poetic koine. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's, a, well, it's a Greek term borrowed from New Testament scholarship, I think, you can correct me about that. Uh, right. That there was this sort of, I think, common language throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, common Greek language that um, sort of transcended 
local uh, dialects or other languages, and they imagined a similar situation in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so uh, the Quran was written in, in no particular dialect, but rather in this larger Koine. So anyway, could, could you explain a bit further? Did I just do okay? Is that how you yeah, would yeah, no, describe yeah. the common <laughs> assumption? And, yeah. yeah, so so I mean, so there are lots of different versions of this common assumption. Um, so so that's that's one thing. Like some people really felt there was a Koine as in a, a, a vernacular Koine. So, all the Arabs basically spoke a, a common language. And okay. Okay. there were some questions like, did that develop with the conquests or did that develop just before, or was that always around? Others said, no, no, it's, it's, they all had their different dialects, but they all had a common poetic register. They all used the same thing to make poetry. Um, so this, I don't know, maybe to some people, this is what Homer is doing in the, in the Greek epics where he also seems to, um, mixed different dialectal forms. Uh, nobody talks of it like this uh, for, for, for Homeric epics, I, at least I don't think so. Um, but I think that might have inspired it. They might have been talking about it like that uh, back in those days. Um, so, so those are two views, um, which are something really difficult to pull apart because not only some people say, well, it's the poet of Koine, others say it's classical Arabic. It's like, okay, what is classical Arabic? And I'm saying, well, classical Arabic is the language of poetry. Um, well, there's all kinds of issues here. Uh, first of all, is the language of poetry really this single, like, common language? Um, I think that should be doubted. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you can really see different linguistic standards, even within different poets and how they're writing their poetry. They're certainly closer to each other than maybe other things, but, but they're still doing their own thing. Uh, so is that true? Second, is that really Pan-Arabian? Are really all the poets from all over Arabia? I don't think there's much evidence for that. Certainly with the questions like, can we really trust that all the poetry is pre-Islamic? And if we trust all the poetry is pre-Islamic, can we really trust that all of that poetry is properly attributed to the right people? And do we actually know enough about these people? I mean, you know, this is pre isnad times. People did not have a chain of transmission uh, of how that poem came to be and where the person came from. Um, so, so that kind of data, well, th there must be parts true of that. And there's really genuine and serious parts of, of the pre-Islamic poetic corpus that is actually pre-Islamic. But, you know, big questions. And like, I don't even think that gets demonstrated. But then the question is, all of a sudden, we get this, this, this kind of um, consensus that develops uh, in the Blachier and Rabin and who else is it? Well, someone else, um, I, I, have, I have them all on the list, who say, well, you know, and the Quran is obviously in that language as well. And I'm like, really? Why? Based on what? Um, and that never comes around. Like, they, they, they kind of tout this as this, well, clearly that's the case. And, well, I mean, if it's clearly the case, I, I, I would assume you can show it. Like, surely, yes, the language of the Quran and language of poetry, they're both Arabic, right? There's no question that it's Arabic, but it's like, is it the same Arabic? That's what we're asking. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can show that, you know, the Quran has consistently different ways of doing things than what the poetry does, that is significant. And we do find that. Do you think there were certain assumptions about, um, about the Prophet Muhammad that sort of li li lie behind that? Do you know what I mean? Were there certain assumptions about, so, because, you know, earlier scholarship on the Quran um, by, you know, so-called Orientalists, was often framed in light of assumptions regarding his psychological development, sociological conditions, sort of social science uh, insights yeah. of early mid 20th century. Do you know what I mean? So there was this idea that, well, gosh, what would Muhammad have chosen for his register or something for the Quran? Does that sound? Yeah. Like so, 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 no, no. I, I think, I think, I think you're you're onto something with that. Um, so much of that is implicit that it's incredibly difficult to to really deduce that. Um, but you get this actually. It's it's a bit later, but you get it with um, Blau. I think uh, says it at some point. No, it's it's Vettler in his um, his book. Oh, what is it called? Um, well, it's about the oral compositional nature of, of, of poetry. Yeah, yeah. 
And he says, well, you know, obviously he would have chosen, you know, the, the, the poetic dialect because that was a prestige dialect. He's like, really? How do we know? Um, you know, I mean, the Quran is not citing poetry everywhere. I mean, that happens in the classical period, but it doesn't happen in the Quran. Um, and so, so that seems to play there. Um, but at the same time, it's like, there, there's this weird situation, like, well, it depends on, on, on how people think about it. Some people just thought, you know, this is just the way people spoke. And it's like, okay, if this is how the way the people spoke, why, why is there this pan-dialectal thing? And then 200 years later, all the grammarians are telling us what the dialects are like. Um, that never really gets resolved. Uh, and I, it just doesn't get engaged with it. It's very strange. Um, and so, you know, if he just spoke like that, he would have also composed his, 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 his Quran like that. So that's one that's playing there, but others like, well, no, he probably spoke something completely different. Rabin is one of these people who says this, spoke something completely different, but specifically chose the poetic register to compose the Quran in. And um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's like, where where would he have picked it up? Uh, how, why? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't doesn't really get addressed. And, and of course you can you can go for, for a, a miraculous explanation there. And that might be very attractive to, to Muslims, but but these researchers saying this do not have that assumption. So it, it's always exactly. it's always exactly. confused me where right. it's even coming from. And yeah. you, you show some examples, um, I think in the first chapter, uh -huh. um, taking advantage of the different reading traditions of the Quran. And we'll return to this, but you know, the, uh -huh. the, the dominant reading tradition is Hafsan Asim, which is you know 95% of current, let's say, editions of the, the Quran, or at least publications of the Quran. Um, follow that. But then there's there's the Warsh tradition, mm -hmm. which um, I don't know if I can put you on the spot and show how uh, some of the difference between Warsh and Hafs. Uh, yes. Yeah, sure. yeah, prove your point. Yeah. No, no, sure. Um, so 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 what, what's kind of interesting, what happens with these things is, is OK, people establish, yes, it's it's a language of poetry and there something gets stuck in. It's like, OK, well, one step is saying it's a language of poetry. Um, the language of poetry is possibly quite broad, but then they kind of implicitly assume that the language of poetry is identical to the classical era because we know it from our textbooks today. Right. And I kind of use this term, which is not always happy, um, the textbook classical Arabic, that is classical Arabic that you'll find in Wright or Fisher, right? Um, and using that term kind of gives the idea that textbook classical Arabic only gets established by Ori Orientalists in the, in the 19th century. It, it's certainly earlier than that, that a real standard develops. Um, so don't don't take that away from it. But it's not clear that that it, that this very strict standard already existed in this early Islamic period. So at the time that the canonical readers uh, are alive, so Hafs dies like 180 or something like that. Uh, Warsh is 190 Hijri, um, I should add. Um, and um, are these readers um, doing just normal classical Arabic? Because that seems to be an implicit assumption. So I have this quote in my book from uh, Weer, Hans Weer, you know, the dictionary Hans Weer, um, who, who is saying, you know, the, the, the Quran is written in the dialect of the Hejaz, we didn't, didn't have Hamzas, but of course he just pronounced them. It's like, really? And, and he cites words, he cites Mu'min, uh, so he cites Mu'min, right, <laughs> the believer, he yeah. cites Bitter. Um, and he says Na'im. It's like all three of those are actually pronounced in the Quranic reading traditions as Bir, Mumin, and Na'im. Na'im. Yes. Um, so that's a very strange, I mean, that's a terrible example to use. Could you because, give the translations of those terms, Marine? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just, oh, believer, yeah. well, and, 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 and uh, um, sleeping, I guess. Um, and uh, so there are two pronunciations, and those are both Quran, and they're considered completely valid and canonical Quran. And you see that, that there's this, this real, like a, a real tradition of opining on the language of the Quran, and uh, until as late as, you know, 2020, where people say, well, the language of the Quran doesn't have imala. So the language of the Quran doesn't have imala? That's a crazy thing to say. Um, you know, a word like uh, bana he built is, is read by four of the 10 canonical readers as bane. Um, that's, that's not, you know, there is imala. So, so imala, imala, imala is an inc inclination of the sound towards an E sound, basically. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's, it's A being pronounced as A. And so, 
and so so people are just opining about what the language of the Quran is, what Tajweed of the Quran is, without ever actually checking. <laughs> which I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's just um, you know going through this research. I mean, many times it's like, am, am I the one going crazy? Am I missing something here? It's like, why are they even making this claim? What, what are they basing it on? And in the end, I have to conclude that, um, you know, it has to be something in terms of, you know, just have some normativity. They just mm. open up the Hafs Quran. It's like, well, this is Quran and there's nothing else. And there is something else. And there, you know, many other traditions. Yeah. So just to, just to clarify this a bit more, going back to the example of Mu'min, Bi'r and Na'im, uh, these are written without the Hamza in the standard Quran that we know from Hafs, but in Warsh, is it different? Yeah, yeah. So so Na'im isn't Na'im... Uh, you only get it in a very specific pronunciation, a uh, very specific context within the reading tradition of Hamza. Uh, but the other two, so uh, so Mu'min and Bi'r, are just recited as Mu'min and Bi'r um, in in uh, the reading of Warsh. So and not just the reading of Warsh, by the way. Yeah, and so your point is, does that yeah. mean somehow Warsh is not in the poetic right. way or something, or is not Arabi if we have these differences? Okay. Right, and and if if that's the case, I mean. I mean, you can't say that the Quran is classical Arabic or is the poetic koine and say this is not classical Arabic or not the poetic koine and at the same time have reading traditions which are considered equally valid. Yes. Um, well, at, at least you first have to explain why you're dismissing those. Um, and the answer cannot be because I conveniently had a half Quran here, right? The, yes. the, the, the yes. explanation needs to be there yes. are valid reasons why you have to dismiss it. I haven't found a valid reason to yeah. dismiss these. Yeah, it's it's a really important point and um, maybe a good time, I, I forget if you cited the term as well, but Suhaib Saeed likes to speak about Huff's yeah. normativity and yeah. just a reminder that, you know, I mean, it's at least from a confessional point of view, standard Islamic teaching is that there are seven or maybe 10 or maybe more standard ways of reading the text. And there are two um, uh, receptions of each way of reading the text. But I mean, at least following from Ibn Mujahid, these are um, all sort of acceptable, right? There's not, it, the fact that Hafs has sort of won the day in the subsequent transmission of the text doesn't mean that it's the only acceptable reading. Does, does that sound yeah, okay? And, and, and to add to that, I mean, it, it, it's a very recent dominance. Like Hafs really, like, okay, so, so nobody's doing the research and I have a research proposal, which I'll hopefully get funding for to figure this out, but nobody has actually looked when this house actually become dominant and where. Um, but, you know, if you go to 13th, 14th century Qurans, house is very difficult to find. It's around 16th, 17th century that you see a shift. Okay, interesting. Um, so it's, it's really, it's a really recent development uh, that house has such a dominant position and Warsh even today is the dominant reading tradition in North Africa. In North Africa. So, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Very good point. Okay, I, I, I'm I, sort of going to jump ahead to, to some points you make in chapter three, because it's directly related to the reading traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and you introduce there the concept of sound change. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think you, you make the point, and this may be a little difficult. I mean, this is a challenge of uh, of of YouTube, and um, I really encourage everyone to follow you know follow the chapter summaries. Well, read the book first of all, but also follow the chapter summaries on on Twitter um, to to sort of see illustrations of these points. Um, but let's try to do it anyway. So uh, you make the point um, that uh, when the re reading traditions, and maybe we should introduce those a little bit more, um, they propose readings of the Quran consonantal text. Um, they're not always consistent. So there's not always this one principle for a particular reading that rules the day. Um, and it, it, you even make the point, and I'd like you to sort of justify this um, a bit, that um, the readers want to, at some point, sort of show off their linguistic prowess in the mm -hmm. way that, um, well, we'll get to pseudo corrections eventually, but in the, mm -hmm. in the way that they fill out the text with, um, yeah. with Ada, basically, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, this is a big question. Yeah, there's also, a lot to say. I didn't... I, I, there's a lot to say, but we'll, 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 we'll try and do it anyway. So, okay. um, so one thing, so, so one of the main principles in historical linguistics is that sound change, that is a change of one sound to another change, uh, happens without exceptions. And if there are exceptions, you have to explain it in some other way. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a well-known principle which works incredibly well. And um, anyone who is a Dutch speaker who learns German will notice this very soon, even when they're just learning German and nobody tells them, they'll know that whenever a Dutch word starts with a P, it will start with a P in German, right? So part become fiat, et cetera. 
Um, the example that I use in my book, which is a lot easier for people who don't know Dutch or German. Um, Was that the word for horse, by the way? Yeah, yeah, it's the okay. word for horse. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the, the example that, that I use in, my, in a book is I, I talk about the words that start with K-N in mm -hmm. English. So um, I'll, I'll pronounce them wrong for now. Knie, okay. knot, uh, knight, right? Um, these words, the reason why they're written with a K at the front in, in English um, is because it was at one point pronounced. And then somewhere along the way, the K, and this happened I, just recently, I read um, a, a thread that's uh, maybe in the 16th century. Uh, this K is lost. And it's any word that started with KN has now lost that K. Um, and you can tell it very nicely if you know Dutch once again, because we still have Knecht, Knoop, uh, Knot, um, Knap, whatever. All words which are also in English, right? Knie uh, for knee, um, which have regularly lost this K. Now, if you do the same thing with the Quranic reading traditions, so we have all these different reading traditions, which are different interpretations of the Quranic texts. Um, the canonical ones all follow the same standard text, uh, the so-called Uthmanic text, and they differ in part in, in the interpretation of what, how, what does a certain word even mean, right? What, what does it say? Is it a passive verb? Is it an active verb? These kinds of things. But far more important uh, to me, but, but also much more, much more prevalent, or linguistic differences, differences in pronunciation, these kinds of things. And that have absolutely no bearing on the meaning whatsoever, which is kind of an interesting thing. Why do these things even differ if it has no influence on the meaning, but has no influence on the meaning whatsoever? And those are by far the most common. But if you start looking at this, this kind of general principle of things should be developing regularly, you just don't see that in the Quranic reading traditions at all. Like there's some rules that you can make absolutely uh, regular and clear, with others, you can. For example, what we see, um, you know, in, in Huff's reading, um, you, um, you know, you normally have, you, you get these weird, like one-off uh, exceptions and um, that just no reason why it would not be following the rule, but it's not following the rule. And a good example of this is um, the word alayhi, which means uh, upon it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And alayhi is how you would normally say it. But in one single case in the Quran, um, Hafs, and only Hafs, reads in Surah Al-Fatih, Alayhu, uh, that's verse 10, uh, Surah Al-Fatih. And, you know, why? Why in that place? It has no clear function, it's just there. And just an exception, exception to the rule. And that's not, not something that should happen in natural language. So this is uh, Quran 48, verse 10. I mean, in a sense, the the, uh, the the verse is not really the or the the message of the verse is not really the key point here, mm -hmm. uh, but it says in who the second part of the verse in whoever fulfills the covenant he has made with God, he will give him a great reward. And if you go to a standard uh, Hafs Quran, which most people uh, would read, their Mushaf would read from it, uh, it says Waman Alpha Bima Ahad Alehu Allah Fasayu so and it's you see right there the dhamma on the head so it's alehu yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so um so what, what you get is is and this is um it's really chaotic and it, it's very popular these days uh, at least in, in apologetic circles that say that the quranic reading traditions are just dialects but they're not dialects because dialects are just language and language should be following regular sound changes and these readings don't at all and well, okay, you could say, well, maybe they borrowed a word from another dialect once, and that works if it wasn't just the sheer volume of these words and just how chaotically they're distributed. So even, you know, the, uh, for example, Al-Kisai, who is the direct student of Hamza, two canonical readers, um, will suddenly have a different um, irregularity at some point. It's like, why, why did he have a different irregularity there? Well, apparently he made a choice to do something different, but it's clearly not coming from, from his native dialect. Uh, so you can't quite figure that out. And it's incredibly difficult to decide, like, like the verse that we just saw, saw of Hafs, why would he do, you know, alayhu there and not somewhere else? Um, why, why not just alayhi like he does everywhere else, which is right. hundreds of times. Right. Uh, and we don't know. Um, part of that seems to just be showing off. Um, 
And that, that kind of gets to the questions like, okay, what's what's going on with, with these kind of maybe more um, artistic things? Because I really think that's what's going on. Um, I think these readers were interested. Uh, some of it is just choice and things they found pretty. Um, in other cases, there may have been real aesthetic reasons to do so. So an example of this, um, like all of these examples are a bit complex to, to really explain, but I'll, the most obvious one, which isn't the strongest example, but it's the easiest one to explain, so I'll go with that one, is Abu Amr. Abu Amr is one of the most dominant readings, um, well, it used to be, it's the Bastard reader, the canonical reader, one of the most dominant readers um, throughout history, uh, but today, you know, only in Sudan, he has like a real following still. Um, he doesn't typically have imala, so he doesn't have this aval, except in verses where those vowels stand in rhyme position. And there, all of a sudden, he has a distinction between a and a. Mm -hmm. So he's clearly choosing, okay, I'm not, I don't want to have this distinction, like what becomes standard in classical Arabic, you don't have a distinction between a and a, but I'll do it whenever it is linguistically relevant when it's at the end of the verse, yeah. which of course is where the rhyme is and it helps with the rhyme, but it gets to kind of, you know, but it, clearly you need to know the text, you need to know the structure of the text to be able to pull that kind of thing off. Right. And that's what he's doing. Okay, okay. So yeah. there's a, a point of sort of, uh, I mean, my kids would say flexing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, exactly. But yeah. a virtu virtuosity in their ability to, um, yeah, to to yeah. Uh, which is part of, of course, what made them popular reciters uh, to be able to flex like that and show yeah. off the kind of things you can do. Yeah, right. great. Well, um, a major argument of the book, uh, and it's in the title. I mean, the subtitle mm -hmm. is "From Its Hejazi Origins: a Quranic Arabic from Its Hejazi Origins to Its Classical Reading Traditions," is that um, the Quran is is not actually um, in a po poetic koine or and you go through this in, in great detail. Um, uh, should we think of it just as Arabiya in a classical sense as earlier scholars have um, held, but rather sh that it shows Hejazi features and that you can detect that uh, from the continental text itself. So from what's commonly known as the Othmanic text um, or the Rasam. And um, uh, I, I wanna uh, get at that with one example that you bring up in chapter four, uh, again, it's probably the easiest one to to speak about, though you 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 give a number of examples, but it's mm. the use in the Quran of zauj, the word zauj, as a unisex. So uh, <laughs> it's applied both for a man and a woman. Um, it, the Quran, correct me if I'm wrong here. I hope I'm getting this right, but doesn't reserve zauja with a tamar buta. Mm for the wife or the, the woman or the female of a pair, um, but it uses those for both. So why is that important, that little insight? Yeah, um, so so I, I, I'll work up to it a little bit from from, uh, from a slightly different angle. So so kind of kind of what, what we were at now. So with these readers, um, you see that they all have, you know, don't have regular features. They all are mutually incompatible, right? You cannot, a word cannot have been bir and bir at the same time. So if you want to know what is a language of composition, which one is it? Well, we get two canonical readers that give two different answers. Um, which one of the two is it? And we cannot really answer that um, looking at these reading traditions because they give two answers. And both of them, you know, both options in, in both readings or multiple readings all clearly show signs of some artificiality. Um, so then I kind of transition to, to to the point it's like, okay, if you want to know something about the language of the Quran, we shouldn't, I mean, we, we can be inspired by the reading traditions and learn something about the reading traditions, but we can't use the reading traditions to say something about it. Um, so, and also the readers that are the canonical readers, you know, are second century um, authorities mostly. Mm -hmm. And so they are not necessarily the best insight into what the language, you know, at the time of composition was like, which was, you know, in, in a century earlier. So I say, we, we really need to look at the Quran, Quranic consonantal text. That is the standard text that we have, which was canonized very early, 650, you know, about probably even less than two decades after the death of the prophet. Um, but really standardized very early, a very, you know, clear text. And what can we tell from that? If we actually look at those things, 
we can use the rhyme, which is very important. This is a standard philological tool, which somehow does not get used by, by, by Arabists when looking at the language of the Quran. Uh, but you have to use rhyme to learn something about the language. Um, and looking at its orthography, you know, the Quran is written in the way it is for a reason. And one thing, the things you can see is indeed, so zawj, the word for, for spouse in the Quran, can mean either wife or husband. And um, if we look at what the Arab grammarians tell us about um, uh, the dialectology of right. this period, they say, look, the people, the people in the Hejaz, they use zawj and they use zawj for both. <laughs> and the people of Najd, that is the Eastern tribes, the mostly Eastern, Bedouin yeah. tribes, they use zawj for husband and zawja for wife. Um, so then you can look, okay, we have this distinction here that is being shown. And we can look in the Quran, well, what is the distinction we actually find? And it's very clear, it's very consistent. The Quran always uses zawj in a unisex way. Whenever it talks about a wife and uses the word, it doesn't use zawja, it uses zawj. So that's a very nice example. Uh, another example, if, if, if I can pull that out as well, it's a very typical one, is to work for that. So the grammarians tell us, Thalika is, is that in Hijaz, and Thalika is the, the form in Najd, or actually everywhere except, except for the Hijaz. That's really important, well, right? Um, of course, anyone who knows a bit of the Quran uh, will know that the start of the Quran is, well, start of the second surah is, Alif la mim, al kitab la rayba And not that al kitab, which could have been there, that would have been a Najdi form. And that is something you can distinguish in the consonantal text because it is consonant, you can tell. And sometimes you can also tell vowels, but that requires some really smart juggling with rhymes, uh, which I do in my book. Well, I'm not sure if it's smart, but it's certainly <laughs> juggling. Um, and um, uh, so, but, but and that's, I, that's when you can really tell. Yeah, yeah. And I want to sort of get to the larger um, argument um, here also. And um, I want to put it in context of where we began, which was speaking about the possibility or the traditional theory that the Quran is in a poetic koine or um, in classical Arabia. Uh, and um, I mean, is this, is this a revolutionary position that you would put it, that the Quran is in Hejazi? Um, and just a reminder to the viewers, I mean, Hejaz, the Hejaz is a region of Western Arabian Peninsula where we find Mecca and Medina. Um, so, uh, I mean, obviously, it's diff you differ from the earlier Western scholars who have said, spoken about poetic koine, uh, but how does this sort of position you vis-a-vis -vis more traditional views? Um, maybe you want to bring up Carl Fuller's, I don't know if you want to speak about that, that's, you know, a German <laughs> Orientalist from the early 20th century, who wrote a book called something like Schriftsprache and Un Volkssprache, the written speech. Other way around. Other way around. Yeah. Volkssprache und Schriftsprache. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, how how revolutionary uh, is this argument? And how does it stand versus other arguments? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, well, both revolutionary and not so revolutionary, which is always fun to do. Um, I get to I get to really um, say that the Islamic tradition is onto something in this case. Um, so, uh, so just to kind of finish up, just finish thought. So, you know, a couple of these examples. Well, what we see is whenever we have something that we can actually tell from the Quranic consonantal text, mm -hmm. where there is a dialectal difference, it consistently agrees with Hejaz. With Hejaz. Mm -hmm. One very weird exception, and I have an explanation for it. But um, other than that, it's you know, I have like this list of like forty differences, which are differences between the dialects, and. Um, and what's important here is like, oh, some people have said, well, these, these, these differences were just being made up by the grammarians in order to show that the Quran was, of course, Hejazi. Um, but the grammarians are not interested in that at all. They're very happy to say, you know, this form is from this dialect and it's in the Quran and that form. And this is usually about stuff that is not in the Quranic and Sinatra text, but they'll often even prescribe, you know, they'll say, um, you know, this is the next form, and you should recite it like that, even though, you know, it's clearly not how it was composed or whatever. And they don't seem to see any conflict there. And besides that, we have grammarians from rival schools, al Farra uh, from Kufa, and uh, Sibawai, very important, both very important, by the way, from Bosra, um, who are reporting the same uh, type of stuff, and they're never using it to defend the Quran. So they're not saying anything that's in the Quran must be Hijazi. So these things are kind of separate, but at the same time, they're looking at this. So um, yeah, so it's, it, 
within Western academia, and especially within the traditional uh, Orientalists, this is this is quite a you know revolutionary point of view to take. So everybody basically always said, look, it's it's just you know the poet de Coine, whatever that was, nobody ever defines it. It was classical Arabic, whatever that is, nobody ever defines it. Like people seem to understand it as, as textbook classical Arabic, but um, if you would really ask them point blank, uh, they would probably say, no, 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 it's what the grammarians describe, which is a very broad kind of category, which doesn't really help us very much um, because to the grammarians, both Nejti and Hijazi are Arabia. Uh, they are part of classical Arabic. So which one of the two, you know, which is it? Um, it could be all. Um, and one other person that, that kind of had a different position here was Karl Vollis, uh, a, a German Orientalist in, who published in 1906, a, a book where he basically said, look, the Quran was originally composed in a vernacular language and was then changed and classicized over time uh, by, by later philologists. So, uh, you know, Muslim philologists. And, um, he was shouted down by, by his contemporaries. Nodica wrote a devastating, devastating review of his work um, without understanding the point. Um, I think I think Wallace had a very keen insight into what was going on and kind of felt, you know, the issues that were there. He understood how important it was to use rhyme. Uh, he understood how important it was to use the reading traditions. And Nodica accuses him of misunderstanding how the reading traditions work. But I think Nodica is wrong about that. I think I think Fuller's knew exactly what he was doing. Um, he's working with very late sources because those were the only ones uh, you know accessible at the time. You know, there's all kinds of issues with the book, with the book, and even with its argumentation. But he saw a lot of stuff, and the main thing was like, how do we even know? Especially in in you know when you look at it as a linguist, and especially a pre-Islamic Arabic, and how the Quran is written today, you would not write classical Arabic the way the Quran is written. Um, because why wouldn't you write an alif to write a hamza, which is the normal way that has always been done before Islam. It's how the other Semitic languages do it. Why are you writing a wow or a ya or an alif sometimes to write a hamza? Um, and he basically made that point. And then people, well, Nodeka, who was of course the most important Orientalist of his time, absolutely brilliant, uh, I should add, but here he really made a mistake. Um, he basically burned it down. And afterwards it was considered absolutely toxic. And people just never really touch it again. People sometimes, you know, um, cite Vollers to say, well, you know, everybody knows that he's wrong. It's like, well, I mean, Nodica didn't show that he was wrong. Um, actually, I mean, I think Vollers is wrong on a lot of things, but nobody ever bothered to show that it was wrong. And um, only um, Jonathan Owens, a uh, fellow linguist and, and, and dialectologist, uh, once pointed out, so, well, you know, Nodica basically shouted him down and his, his career just ended. Uh, not, which, the, not the only time, sadly, that that kind of thing no, no, came down no. in academia. Yeah, you know, it, it's really, it's really shocking. Um, but so, so, so within Western, Western academia, if we want to use that, or you know, let's call it Orientalists in this case, because that's really what they were at the time. Um, that this 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 never took off. They were always like, you know, any any suggestion that that uh, the, the Quran was written in the vernacular is pure um, propaganda for the Quraysh, who, that was the tribe of the Muhammad, uh, of Muhammad um, uh, who were trying to show that their language was the best language, uh, so we should just discard it. But actually, uh, and that's the thing, there are tons of traditions that say, write down the Quran in the Qurayshi dialect um, because it was revealed in that way. Um, and those are pretty good traditions. Like, you know, we can't trace it back all the way to the people that, that they're attributed to, but they're early. So we get these kind of traditions from, you know, uh, great names like Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, um, which, you know, without him, there will be no Islam, uh, not the way we know it. Um, and so we have these kinds of reports and we have reports of like, um, uh, Ibn Mas'ud, one of the companions of the Prophet, uh, reciting in a certain way, and another person saying, like, why are you reciting it like this? It's like, well, you know, I'm just reciting in the Hudayi dialect. And he's like, you can't do that. You have to recite it in the Quraysh way. Um, so we have all these kind of traditions around talking about that you should be recite, either recite the Quran in the Quraysh way, um, or that at least the Quran was written in the Quraysh way or revealed in the Quraysh way. And these are, these are good, you know, fairly good traditions. And what's interesting about it is even though the Orientalists always said, well, this is just propaganda for, for the Quraysh and it was obviously just, just written in, in classical Arabic, 
nobody ever uses this for propagandistic purposes. They never, you know, it would be very beneficial for a, a Hijazi reader to say, um, well, I recited like, recited like this way because it's the way that, that the Quraysh did it and, you know, I follow the way of the Quraysh, but they don't. Um, very often, they very explicitly do not follow that. Al-Fara, the Kufan uh, grammarian I mentioned already, was a direct student of Al-Kisai. And Al-Kisai reads tons of things that, which are explicitly admitted by Al-Fara are not Hijazi ways of doing it. Um, so what's going on there? Um, it doesn't have that, that kind of um, that kind of function that it has been accorded. That's just because all the Orientalists were working within a kind of um, framework, framework, thinking about right. that, that right. The classical Arabic was the greatest thing ever, and therefore everything must be like classical Arabic. And it just projected that onto the early, early philologists, which just did not have that framework at all. Marine, aren't there also certain assumptions within Islam mm -hmm. um, about the, the nature of the text and its transmission, um, which are sort of destabilized by, by um, some of your arguments. I mean, um, there are these traditions about the Quran being revealed in the dialect of Quraysh, but there is a, a standard, at least I hear it. I don't actually know, maybe this is more modern apologetics, but mm -hmm. that the Quran is pure Arabia. I mean, this is something I hear often from, um, right. from mus Muslim friends and, and um, you know, just reading, reading scholarship, especially online. Um, and this, I mean, let me give one more example. So maybe you want to comment on that, but let me throw in another example. Um, you, you know, for, for example, the, the orthography of certain words with a wow, and you've alluded to this, but like the words for salat, um, I think mishkat is written this way, hayat, um, zakat is definitely one of them. They're all written with, with a wow. Um, and, uh, the, but they're pronounced, they're pronounced with basically an, an alif, um, uh, so, I mean, um, and I think your argument is, no, they've been pronounced incorrectly. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, a believer might have other ways theologically of working through it. But, I mean, in terms of the primitive phonology of the text, they, in the Hejaz, they would have been pronounced something like solot or hayot. Is, is, that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, approach it from two sides. So, on one hand, um, yeah, pure Arabia. Well, Hijazi is Arabia, right? So, so if you if you read the grammarians, they'll tell you, well, they'll, they'll tell you what Arabia is. They'll tell you all the things that are good, and they'll tell you all these things that we've mentioned so far, as, uh, including the one that you just mentioned, are things that are perfectly acceptable, Arabia, mm -hmm. whatever that is. And the Quran constantly tells uh, you know its its audience that it's Arabi. Right. Or Arabi Mubin, Mubin, which I think this is this is, this is a, an argument that that Ahmad Jalal put together. This is it is explicitly saying, look, this is a text and it should be understood by the people, and that's why it's in Arabic. Um, so it's specifically about the vernacular nature and not about the classical Arabic nature of the text, which is how it's sometimes been understood. So taking this example of of um, these words like like um, uh, we, we very often say salat these days with the final t, but um, the Salah. proper classical Salah. Arabic pronunciation is Salah. Um, but, but taking those, um, indeed, they're written with well. And what's interesting about them is that Siboy explicitly says, one, that words like Hayat, uh, so Hayat, Salat, and Zakat, I think he mentions, those are the three. Um, and he writes them with, well, at least in the editions that we have, he writes them with Elifs, mm -hmm. uh, which is the modern classical spelling. Um, it's okay to pronounce these with uh, an elif at tafkhim, as he calls it, for Quranic recitation, explicitly for Quranic recitation. And this is the way that the people of uh, the Hejaz do it. Mm -hmm. So he's saying these words should be pronounced as hayo and zako and uh, salo. So he's one saying this is the way to do it. That's why it's written with a while. I mean, that, well, that's not how he, how he explains, but actually some later philologists do explain it that way and it's how I would explain it and how Ahmad uh, Jalad has explained it. Um, and he's explicitly saying it's okay to recite the Quran that way and it's the way the people of the Hijaz do it. And we have a Hijaz document that is spelling it that way. Um, you know, I would say one and one is two and that should be the proper, proper way of pronouncing it. Of course, that is not how anyone pronounces it today. 
Um, and it's actually, I think it's quite unlikely that at the time that Sibuai is writing, who is basically contemporary with the canonical readers, many people were reciting it that way. But still, he says it's okay. Um, and you know, he, he's a Basran. He certainly knew and has heard recited um, uh, Abu Amr, the, the canonical reader. He doesn't say Salah. He says Salah. And he says Haya. Um, so, so these things are not... Uh, and so there was a, there was really a clear flexibility with what you could do with the language. It was perfectly fine to use these different dialectal forms, and um, that seems to have been to some extent uh, occasioned by by this um, this famous hadith, uh, the Sabat Ahruf hadith, the seven modes, seven letters, seven right. whatever you want to call it, right. um, which seems to be a hadith that is explicitly permissive of variants. It's not so clear that they were talking about these kinds of variants um, and not something maybe a bit more subversive, um, like wording being much more different and not so much arguing about the vowels. I think vowel things was like, I mean, what are you talking about? This is just dialect stuff. We just do whatever we like. And we, we do what is pretty um, or what is fashionable, these kinds of things. Uh, but it's certainly understood that way. And, and certainly like early philologists do start explaining this these kind of variations um, through that kind of license. And that's how it's very often done today. Okay, yeah, that's a really helpful way of putting it, uh, sort of asking what is Arabiya? Why is Hejazi okay. dialect? Yeah, that, that is Arabiya. So that I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, I want to ask sort of one more technical question as we sort of move, move towards, towards the end. Um, there are places in the book, I'm thinking of chapter six now, you introduce the notion of pseudo corrections. And what I found really interesting is that you use insights from other Semitic languages to mm -hmm. identify what may be pseudo corrections in the reading traditions of the Quran. So the way that the consonantal text um, was um, uh, was voweled. Um, uh, maybe I have two more technical questions. So here's here's uh, here, here's one. I just realized another one asked, but I wanted to use the example of of mejuj. So in mm -hmm. I think in uh, in Hafs we read mejuj with with a hamza. Is that, is that, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, and this is, um, you know, so some of our viewers may know um, this is uh, something that comes up in the story of the Karnain, the so called two horned one, um, which a number of scholars like uh, Kevin Van Bladel, um, Tommaso Tizay, and others uh, before them, I mean, uh, many scholars have worked on this story of the two horned one, usually associated with traditions in late antiquity surrounding Alexander the Great. But one anecdote that comes up in the course of the story has to do with the two peoples, Gog and Magog, um, who are known sort of from the Bible. Um, I think it's actually complicated because in the Old Testament, there's references to kings known as Gog and Magog, but in the book of Revelation, I believe they appear as peoples. And in the Quran, they appear as peoples as well in the story of the Quran. Anyway, that's not what really matters for your argument. Uh, what matters is that, that Hamza, uh, and you show that um, I mean, if this is a loan word, which it seems to be from um, Hebrew, maybe passing through other languages, but in Hebrew, there's there's no sign of the Hamza. So why is there a Hamza in the Quran? Yeah, yeah. So so this is this is basically what I develop. So so um, one one of the, um, the the things that I, I kind of kind of came up on uh, when I was trying to figure out, okay, why haven't people looked at the Quran the way I'm doing? And it's because people say, well, there's there's hardly any pseudo corrections, or there's no, I mean, that that's a claim. This is something that Joshua Blau said. Um, there are no pseudo corrections in the Quran. I was like, really? Do you think so? I mean, have you checked? Um, which tends to be usually the answer, no, nobody checks. <laughs> um, so can we, uh, and actually, funnily enough, Blau actually identifies one, but somehow um, it just doesn't register as, as being an argument against himself. Um, so yeah, so so the word in, in Hebrew would be it'd be moho. Um, and maybe it was first borrowed into Greek before it came in, into um, Arabic, but Greek doesn't have a glossal stop or a, a hamza as we call it. Mm -hmm. So they would say mago. Um, and then you have so the question is, well, where did this hamza come from? Um, they clearly didn't get it from anywhere because it's it's mago. And uh, that's actually what nine of the 10 canonical readers do. Uh, they say majuj. 
there's only one, and that's Al Sim, and that's and Hafs being one of the transmitters, um, who, who suddenly has his hands out in there. What is it doing there? Um, well, the answer seems to be it's just, it's just wrong. I mean, there's, there's just no, it, it should not be there. So someone at some point is like, well, this word looks like it could have a Hamza in it. And it probably has something to do with how it was like etymologized, because it kind of looks like a, a maf'ul, a passive participle. Mm, so point. maybe it was a passive participle of some root adja. Yes, um, right, right. So yeah, therefore, yeah, I'll yeah, put the Hamza in it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Well, the important thing is, to do that, you have to kind of have an, an, a, an analytical um, linguistic framework to even be able to analyze these kinds of words and then read it that way. And apparently something convinced them. And there's these kind of etymology around. You'll find them in, in Jeffrey's book. Um, and you can kind of see, like, how were they thinking about these words, uh, which were names, basically. And very often they say they're foreign, but sometimes they try to explain it. Um, and this might be one of those, those cases. But whatever is going on with Hamza, it should not be there. And it was inserted at some point by, well, it seems by Asim or maybe by his teacher, um, but it can't have been there in the original composition. Mm -hmm. basically. So it, yeah, and it says something about an earlier, well, something related to an earlier point we made about the, uh, the, um, the creativity and the active mm -hmm. Uh, reshaping of the text in the in the reading traditions. That's, yeah, that's really, really important. Okay, my last last technical question um, is about uh, chapter seven, where mm -hmm. you um, introduce the question of uh, does the consonantal text of the Quran have signs of arab and or and or tenween? So arab is, um, you know, basically the vocalization of the text according to grammatical principles. Um, yeah. So how do you even get at that question with the consonantal text? Yeah, um, it, it's a really difficult question, um, and, and I already wrote an article about it years ago together with my uh, good good friend Philip Stokes. Um, so, and this is this is no doubt probably the most controversial part of my book, and I'm sure people will disagree with it, but I, I think I make a good case for it. Um, so the point is this: if you look at the Quranic consonantal text, uh, just the way it is written, it does not look like how you would write classical Arabic. Because the reason why we talk about tanween is because, you know, it's, it's to, to, to put a noon or something like that. Right. And it's because words end in noon. You, you know, a man is rajulun. Well, why would you write rajulun, ra, jim, lam, and no noon at the end? Um, that's really kind of strange. Uh, the same thing is with, with you know, nouns in, in, with the um, feminine ending which you know like woman is imra'atun which ends in atun but you write alif uh, there we go alif mim ra alif maybe and then a ha why would you write a ha there if you say imra'atun there's explanations for that it's like well it's written according to a causal spelling principle and in pause so if you would stop on that word you would say imra'a well, first, why would you have a puzzle spelling principle? That's not so obvious. That's actually like that really requires a very specialized knowledge. And the people who are telling us this are, you know, fourth century grammarians. Um, why would fourth century grammarians know what they're doing? And um, and then the question, so, so I kind of go into the question, well, is there really a puzzle spelling principle on these kinds of questions? And I answer no, and these are really, really complex and statistical arguments, which I won't go into too much, but, but the basic point is, look, why would you write a word that ends in N with an elif? That is strange. It looks like it's writing rajula and not rajulan. Mm -hmm. Why would you write a word that ends in un with nothing? It looks like it's writing rajul and not rajulun. Um, and of course, the modern dialects, the vast majority of them don't have this tenuin. Right. And right. the earliest layers of, of Arabic written in other scripts, like uh, the Damascus Psalm fragment that my, uh, my uh, good colleague Al Jalad worked on, right. which is something written in something very close to the language of the Quran, does not have this kind of tenuin. So it does I, have. Can, yeah. can I just interrupt you there just to introduce very briefly? So yeah, the Psalm sure. fragment is a very early text around, is it around 700 or earlier? I mean, yeah, probably around 700, like 8th century. Yeah. Okay, okay. So er, er, early 8th century um, of, of a Psalm from the Bible written in Arabic, um, but it does not have signs of the Tenmi right in it. Yeah, and it's okay. written with Greek scripts. It should, we should add that uh, specific point, yeah. 
Um, and um, so, so there's all these, 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 so, and there's been this assumption, well, all the reading traditions have, have this Arab and Tanween. Um, so therefore the Quran must have had that. And I say, well, no, I mean, we should look at the Quranic consonantal text. It's very difficult to see final short vowels in the Quranic consonantal text, but you can sometimes look at internal rhymes and these kinds of things. And we find cases where khayran is clearly rhyming as khayra uh, within a, a sentence in a non-pausal position, which seems to suggest that it's really being pronounced as it was written. Um, so I kind of do this kind of thing. It's like, well, you just wouldn't expect the language to be written like this if it was pronounced like this. Um, and that's that's a complex orthographic argument and I couldn't uh, do justice to it all right now, but, um, but that's kind of the point. And I, I say, look, the reading traditions all have this, that's true. But is it so weird that that would have been imposed onto the text, which is basically what I'm arguing. So, uh, and this is something where I get, once again, get very close to what Follows actually said. Follows had, Slightly different opinions about this, but you know, uh, grosso modo, it's 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 the same same idea. Um, he said, "Look, it's very close to kind of how do modern vernaculars have it." And it's like, well, why wouldn't the Quran be like the modern vernaculars in this aspect? Um, many pre-Islamic uh, Arabic dialects already lost the uh, Arab and Tanween. It's not every single dialect had it, which was for a long time believed to be the case. But really, with with uh, Al Jalal's work on pre-Islamic Arabic, it's very clear that's not the case. Um, we cannot just assume that this is true. And as we can tell that the Quranic reading traditions are doing all kinds of stuff to the language, why wouldn't this be imposed into the language? And especially because it is considered absolutely central to the Arab grammarians. To them, there is no Arabic without Arab, right? Arabiya needs to have Arab. It needs to have that system of inflectional uh, endings at the end of a word. Without it, it's not Arabiya. And we're talking about grammarians, even you know, as late as the 12th century, where we have absolutely no doubt that there were hardly any vernaculars left, if there were any left, that had uh, Arab the, in the way that we see it in classical Arabic, but they don't even acknowledge it. It doesn't exist to them because it's not Arabia. Arabia needs to have it. So of course, if Arabia is the best Arabic and the Quran is the best Arabic composition, it needs to have it. And it's even in the name. So Arab is a, Causative um, uh, verbal nouns. So it means to make Arabic. To make Arabic. It is something that yes. actually makes it Arabic. Yeah. Um, so, so um, I think that's a very important point. It's like, well, you know, the Quran is Arabi. Uh, we've decided that it that says, it says it itself. It says that it's Arabi, as you've pointed right. out. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, so it must have Arab. Um, so I kind of argue from from that point of view. It's like, well, clearly, it's not so weird that it would that there would be a let's call it a conspiracy of silence about it not having that originally. Um, because there is a conspiracy of silence about Arab all the way until basically modern days, even today, Arabic is being taught. And when, when students who don't speak with any Arab at all screw up their Arab, they're like, don't you speak Arabic? Well, no, not that kind of Arabic. Um, so if, even if that, that is around today, and you know, that acknowledgement is just not there in the literature at all. Why would it be there in the beginning where we have so few sources? Um, and then I kind of show like, look, there's actually some places where clearly the readers are basically explicitly, so we have traditions and early traditions which are well-sourced, explicitly saying, well, you know, I, I had to decide what, what Arab I had to put on this word and I decided this because I thought it was prettier. Um, which is not the kind of, you know, this was this, this was transmitted all the way from the prophet until me without right, any, right. any interruption. You give, examples, no. you give examples, sorry to jump in, but you give examples, yeah. for example, of, of Thamud, um, mm -hmm. the, the people of Saleh, and whether mm -hmm. that should be, how that should be read, especially when it's in genitive, or Saba, the, the mm -hmm. kingdom of, of Sheba. And you yeah. give examples of people not being sure about how exactly, is this a diptote, is it a triptote? How, how do you read it exactly? So the question of that being transmitted is um, at least uh, doubtful, yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. So so basically that, that's that's where I land. It's like, look, I don't think the Quran, well, it certainly did not have the inflectional system in, in the way that we see it um, in, in the Quranic reading traditions. There's room for debates i think um i know i know hyphen sitki is not always um as convinced uh, by my arguments as i am but you know that, that's okay um but but it's certainly a question that needs to be asked and needs to be thought about like why do we know and 
we can't just point to the tradition and say, well, all the reading traditions do this. I mean, first of all, you know, the same people who say that Arab must be part of the language of the Quran have decided that the reading traditions can apparently be ignored when they say something else. Um, because, you know, they say there's no beer in the Quran and there's no movement in the Quran. They're there. Um, so, you know, we, we have to have at least some kind of principle why we can either trust these reading traditions or cannot trust these reading traditions. We can't do both. And I think going from the Quran and Consonant text, using rhyme, using the orthography, using, seeing how the system works, that's the way to really get to the language of the Quran. And that's what I do when I come to the conclusion that, yeah, only an becomes a, and all the other Arab is lost mm. in uh, Quranic Arabic. Well, it's a very, I think, um, impressive uh, principle to begin with. Let, let's, mm. let's actually pay attention to the text and not everyone has the skills to sort of sort through um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the text in a way that allows you to draw from it um, linguistic uh, rules or observations, uh, but I think you, you've shown you've shown how it can be done. I'm sure mm. the last point about Arab and Tenwin will lead to lots of debate. I look forward to seeing the comments comments on this video. Um, uh, but also, I'd uh, like to give you a chance to let let people know. You know, do you have a new project that you'd like to um, share with them? Uh, and also, how should they stay in touch with your work? Yeah, so, so well, staying in touch with my, my work, the easiest way to do it is on my Twitter account, which is at PhDNix. Um, I have a, a Patreon account where some people follow me and, and, and throw me some money, um, which is always wonderful because right now I am still unemployed. Um, and uh, at least, you know, within academia, I have, I have a job right now in game development, which is a lot of fun, but I'd like to do more in academia. Um, I have a research project uh, proposal, and I'm just waiting out here at the end of this month if they'll give me a ton of money, uh, which would be on the Quranic reading traditions um, before canonization based on manuscripts. That would be wonderful. There's another proposal which would be after the canonization, which would also be great if I would get it. Um, but I just don't know right now. Uh, so it's, it's a bit uncertain. Um, I'm working on a, on a project on my Patreon, uh, working on a, on a critical edition of the Quran. So really looking at different manuscripts and trying to reconstruct what the original Uthmanic text looked like. If that's something you're interested in, uh, you can follow me on Patreon for that. Um, so those are the things that I kind of have, have um, coming up right now. It's not, it's, 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 you know, it's always uncertain in academia, uh, especially right now. So we'll see where it goes. Right. Um, but I have my fingers crossed and I hope uh, everybody else will have their fingers crossed as well. Mm -hmm. And hopefully uh, by the end of this month, I'll have very, very good news. Um, but for now, there's my book, uh, which you can download for free. Uh, so check that out. Uh, I'm really, really proud of it. And I hope people will find it exciting. Wonderful. Well, allow me to um, also encourage everyone to, to, um, to find you on Twitter, and um, there are incredible threads that Marine offers us, um, not only on you know the book recently, but if you look back into the the, the earlier work on Twitter, I mean, just really detailed, um, informative threads about questions um, of manuscripts, questions of paleography or the writing traditions, and also the reading traditions and the transmission of the Quran, and some fun stuff also, and um, in addition to word, Wordle scores sometimes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I'd, and I encourage at the end of the threads, you know, there's an opportunity to support Marine. Um, so I'd really encourage people to do that and to find him on Patreon with his critical edition of Quran project. And yeah, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. It was wonderful to talk to you. Great. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos, starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.